What is active learning, and how does it affect student performance? Welcome to my new series on the scholarship of teaching and learning, where educators test teaching strategies and theories about how people learn, and then share their findings by publishing in peer-reviewed journals. In this episode, I present an article that had a huge impact on how people think about the way teaching is done in higher education. The paper, by Scott Freeman and colleagues, came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a respected scientific journal, in 2014. As of this recording, it has been cited by researchers an astounding 1,776 times. The study is all about figuring out if active learning in university science, technology, engineering, and math courses is really associated with increased student performance. So how do you test that? First, let's define active learning. Active learning is when you engage in activities that promote analysis, synthesis, or evaluation. Or in other words, doing things and thinking about what you're doing. The idea is that this kind of learning is better than learning simply from listening, or copying notes, or following instructions, because it goes along with our current understanding of how the mind and brain operate during the learning process. To test if active learning really has an effect on student performance, the authors systematically searched for every study that compared traditional lecturing to active learning without changing time spent in class, for regular undergraduate courses with changes only to in-class sessions in STEM disciplines and which assessed student performance. This ended up being 225 studies. Then they took the data from all of these studies and pooled them together, reanalyzing them to figure out the differences in failure rate between students who were taught with traditional lecturing only and those who were taught with at least some active learning strategies. What they found was that students in traditional lecture courses were 1.5 times more likely to fail than students in the same course, being given the same tests, but being taught with active learning strategies. On average, the active learning version of the courses had 12% less failure. They also reassessed the data to summarize the difference for test grades, usually final exams. Again, they found that the students who did active learning had a significant advantage. On average, test scores increased by half a standard deviation, and they observed this enhancement in all of the different disciplines they tested. Now describing the difference in test scores in terms of standard deviations, called effect size, is perhaps a kind of abstract way to think about it but it makes sense when dealing with a bunch of different topics and test types, like in this case. So let's take a minute to figure out what it actually means to increase test scores by half a standard deviation. Essentially, a standard deviation is just a measure of how broad the spread of grades for a given test might be. For example, if practically everyone in the class got a 70% on the exam, then the standard deviation would be quite small, and so the difference in actual grades would be small as well. Meanwhile, in another class, you might have lots of students getting everything from 50s to 90s, meaning there would be a big standard deviation, and therefore the difference in grades would be quite large. But either way, if you got 74 in the first class and 99 in the second class, you might be the highest scoring student in both cases. So if the active learning condition showed a change from 70 to 72 in the first example, you might consider that a pretty significant difference and you would see that as a similarly significant increase in terms of standard deviations. At the same time, a boost in the second class from 70 to 80 should be considered an equally significant increase and would have the same increase in effect size. By reporting the change in grade in effect size, the researchers can account for these kinds of differences between all the tests and the studies and give a more accurate idea of the real significance or size of the effect. Half a standard deviation would cover the range of approximately 38% of the grades around the average. Or, in other words, someone who got the average test score would have increased by the equivalent of 19 percentile. In conclusion, by bringing together all the data from this comprehensive collection of SOTL studies, these researchers were able to demonstrate that active learning significantly improved student test scores and reduced failure rates across STEM disciplines. So much so, in fact, that it brought up a big question. Could traditional lecturing be so much less effective than teaching with active learning as to be unethical? If these experiments had been randomized controlled trials for medical intervention, 
the controls may have been stopped for benefit. Or to think about it in another way, consider that there were a total of 29,300 students in the lecturing control groups. According to the difference in failure rates, 3,516 fewer students would have failed if they had been taught with active learning strategies. So here are a few other things to think about and questions that still need to be answered by future SOTL research. What would happen if active learning became universal or required? Would the benefits remain or could the improvements just be a result of the newness or intrigue associated with experiencing something different from the norm? Which types of active learning are the most effective and for which topics or student populations? Then there's the question of how much active learning is best. Is more always better, or does too much lead to student pushback? And of course, how much does it affect the teacher workload? As you can see, there are still a lot of questions to answer, but that's what this series on SOTL is here for. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, I encourage you to like and subscribe. I'd also love to hear what you thought of the paper. Link in the description. And please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future episodes. Till next time, Dan CBJ.